So last speaker for this session is uh, Abigail Gailhold. She will tell us about the power polarity proteins promote enhanced spindle assembly checkpoint activity in germline blastomeres. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, my name is Abby. I'm a joint postdoc in the Lab A lab in Montreal and with the Maddox Labs for now in Chapel Hill. And so I'm broadly interested in using C. elegans as a model system to understand how these highly dynamic and I think really beautiful events that make up mitosis are affected by the in vivo context in which a cell divides. And today I'm going to talk about one of my projects, which is looking at how activity of the spindle assembly checkpoint um, can vary as cells acquire certain fates during development and some um, early results suggesting that PAR proteins may be implicated in this. Okay, so the spindle assembly checkpoint is a core mitotic regulator that prevents chromosome segregation errors by monitoring the metaphase to anaphase transition and preventing um, anaphase onset until all kinetochore microtubule attachments have been made. Uh, and chromosomes are stably bioriented on the metaphase plate. So core checkpoint proteins are recruited to unattached kinetochores where they catalyze formation of the mitotic checkpoint complex, which then inhibits the anaphase promoting complex by binding to its cofactor CDC20. So following spindle perturbations, it's activity of the spindle assembly checkpoint that delays mitotic progression, and the length of this delay is related both to the severity of the spindle defects and also to the ability of the checkpoint to detect these defects and to inhibit the anaphase promoting complex in response. So the checkpoint has been studied extensively in, in cell culture models, but much less is known about how it functions in vivo, in particular whether or not uh, it can be adapted to different cellular contexts. So we've previously used in situ live imaging to characterize the checkpoint in the adult uh, germline stem and precursor cells in C. elegans or GSPCs. Uh, and when we measured the length of the mitotic delay that we got in these cells following spindle perturbations, one of the things that we noticed was that these cells delayed for significantly longer than embryonic blastomeres. And so we thought that this was particularly interesting in light of the long-standing but poorly understood observation that checkpoint activity can actually vary widely between cell types and that embryonic cells are thought to have a sort of notoriously weak checkpoint. And we thought it was a good opportunity to investigate at least one example of how checkpoint activity might be modulated during development. So we went back into the embryo to ask whether or not the embryonic precursors of the GSPCs, the P lineage blastomeres shown here, uh, also show prolonged mitotic delays. And so we needed a way to generate spindle defects in different embryonic lineages and at different embryonic stages. And so to do this, we've been using a fast-acting temperature-sensitive allele of ZYG1, which was nicely introduced by Michael earlier. So ZYG1 is required for centrosome duplication, so we shift these guys up on the microscope. Um, cells that have already duplicated their centrosomes will enter a normal bipolar division. Centrosome duplication will then fail and cells will enter mitosis with a single spindle pole and form these monopolar spindles. So cells with a single spindle pole will delay in mitosis, presumably because they fail to satisfy the checkpoint. At some point you start to see the chromosomes collapse around the single, uh, the single pole and start to decondense. So in these cells we score mitotic timing. Where did my mouse go? Okay, as the time between nuclear envelope breakdown and the start of decondensation. I kind of lost my mouse, so I don't know if it can come back. No? Maybe? Okay. Um, all right, so I'll try and do this without being able to point. So when we looked at uh, 2 to 16 cell stage embryos and we looked at normal bipolar divisions, what we saw was that the timing of mitosis was relatively invariant um, across both cell lineages and embryonic stages. Ah, there we are. Uh, when we looked at cells with monopolar spindles, what we noticed was that cells in the germline lineage, shown in red here, delayed for both longer than their immediate somatic siblings and also somatic cells in the next embryonic stage. And so this last point is particularly important because at each embryonic stage, the, embryonic, uh, sorry, the germline blastomere is also the smallest cell. And some nice work recently from Mathilde Gali, while she was in David Morgan's lab, has shown that in the C. elegans embryo, as cell size decreases, the length of the spindles, uh, the checkpoint dependent delays increases. So we took cell size into account in two ways. And from here on, I'm just gonna focus on the AB lineage in gray and the germline lineage in, in red. And so in our monopolar spindle assay, we can measure nuclear area, which has been shown to scale with cell size, and that allows us to plot the one-to-one -one correlation you're seeing here between delay and nuclear area. 
In the second set of experiments, we established the mean cell volume for the different blastomeres, and here I'm plotting the mean, uh, mean volume relative to the variation of mitotic timing. And so in both cases, I think you can see that the germline blastomeres seem to be delaying uh, disproportionately to their size. So next, we wanted to know whether these delays were in fact dependent on the checkpoint or whether we'd see differences in mitotic timing in the absence of checkpoint regulation. And so to do this, we used a null allele of MDF2, which is MAD2, uh, and RNAi to MDF1, uh, which is MAD1. And in both cases, we see that cells exit mitosis at more or less the same time, irrespective of their size um, or of their lineage. So what I've shown you so far is that in both germline cells and somatic AB cells, as cell size decreases, the length of mitotic delays increases. However, the relationship between cell size and mitotic delay appears to be different between the two lineages. And so this suggests that in addition to cell size, there are lineage-specific inputs that are either in the case of the germline enhancing these checkpoint-dependent delays or in the case of the somatic cell suppressing them. So it's important to point out at this point that we don't know whether this difference is due to differences at the level of the checkpoint itself, so either in its sensitivity to spindle defects or its ability to inhibit the interference-promoting complex, uh, or in differences in, in terms of how these different lineages uh, experience spindle defects. So to start to try and get a handle on this, we've been focusing on the two-cell stage with the AB somatic blastomere and the germline P1 blastomere. So as I'm sure you are all probably familiar with, AB and P1 are specified by the asymmetric division of P0, which is regulated by the PAR proteins. So the asymmetric distribution of PAR proteins does two things. It generates Asymmetry in pulling forces on the mitotic spindle, which shifts the spindle to the posterior and generates the size difference between the two cells. It also generates asymmetries in the segregation of sulfate determinants, such that certain things become enriched in AB and others become enriched in P1. So we wanted to test how much of the difference in mitotic delay between AB and P1 was due to their difference in size and whether or not there was any evidence that the asymmetric segregation of sulfate determinants uh, played a role. So we measure cell size by looking at spindle displacement along the anterior-posterior axis, which will predict where cleavage furrow formation occurs and give us a sense of roughly what proportion of P0 is being allocated to each daughter cell. So when we look in control embryos, we see that roughly 58% of P0 is allocated to AB, and in these same cells, uh, the P1 blastomere de delays for about four and a half minutes longer than its immediate somatic sibling. Um, we then depleted GPR2, which is required for those asymmetric pulling forces on the mitotic spindle. And so in this case, we end up with AB and P1 being the same size. Um, and now the difference in delay between AB and B1 has been reduced, but P1 is still delaying for significantly longer than, than AB. We next depleted the, post, uh, the anterior PAR protein, PAR6. And again, you can see AB and P1 are the same size. However, now the difference in delay between the two cells has been further reduced. When we deplete um, either of the posterior PAR proteins, either PAR1 or PAR2, we see a similar trend, but a more variable phenotype. And when we combine PAR1 RNAi with a PAR2 mutant, we can see that the difference in mitotic timing between the two of them is more or less suppressed. So this suggests that in addition to cell size, um, either PAR proteins themselves or the asymmetric segregation of some cell fate determinant is contributing to the duration of checkpoint-dependent delays in these cells. So um, the current thinking for how PAR proteins generate uh, asymmetries between A, B predicts that the phenotype of posterior and anterior PAR proteins will differ. Uh, and this is because if you deplete, for example, the posterior PAR proteins, you lose inhibition of MEX5 or 6. MEX5, 6 can, uh, will then promote degradation of germline factors and maintenance of somatic factors, and you end up with a posterior P1 cell that behaves more like a wild-type AB cell. And the converse is also true, that if you deplete the anterior PAR proteins, you end up with an anterior AB cell that behaves like a posterior P1 cell. So we wanted to see whether or not this model also pertains to the differences that we see. However, we know that depleting the PAR proteins will affect cell size, and we know that affecting cell size will affect the duration of checkpoint-dependent delays. So in order to interpret the magnitude of delay in our, our checkpoint uh, sorry, in our, our uh, PAR knockdowns, we needed a way to take cell size into account. So to do this, uh, we generated A, B, and P1 cells of a range of volumes and measured the duration of checkpoint-dependent delays in our monopolar spindle assay. And so as you can see here, as cell size decreases, the duration of mitotic delay increases in both P1 cells in red uh, and AB cells in gray. And if we fit a linear model to these two different data sets, we can see that the relationship between size and delay is different. We can then take this data and bin cells based on their volume, which allows us to compare cells that are of comparable size. And when we do this, we see 
that uh, P1 cells in red are always delaying for significantly longer than comparably sized AB cells shown in gray. So we can then take this data now and try and interpret the magnitude of delay that we see in our PAR knockdowns. So when we knock down either of the anterior PAR proteins, so PAR6 or PKC3, what we see is that P1 cells in these embryos, shown here and here, uh, don't really change much in the duration of their delay, whereas AB cells shown here and here are delaying um, with timing that's comparable to a similarly sized P1 cell and significantly longer than a similarly sized AB cell. So this fits with the model that, that I just described. However, when we deplete uh, the posterior PAR proteins, either PAR1 or PAR2, again, we see that P1 here and here is relatively unaffected, so its timing is similar to a comparably sized P1 cell shown here and here. When we look at AB cells, um, we see either a sort of intermediate phenotype, but tending towards longer delays uh, relative to their size. So, I think we have reasonable genetic evidence that some of the difference in mitotic delay between AB and P1 is downstream of PAR proteins. However, we need to explain why knocking down the posterior PAR proteins and the anterior PAR proteins gives a similar phenotype in our case. And so one really preliminary model that could explain this is if there's some factor X that's normally enriched in the posterior, which acts to enhance checkpoint-dependent delays. And when you knock down either of the PARs, this factor becomes equilibrated between the two cells. And as long as it's not limiting in its quantity, you'd expect this to enhance the duration of delays in AB and suppress them uh, and leave P1 largely unaffected. And so, of course, without knowing what factor X is, this is just purely speculative, and I definitely welcome any input from people who uh, think about PAR proteins and polarity a, a lot more than, than I do. So in the meantime, um, we're also starting to look at what might differentiate somatic and germline blastomers at a more molecular level. And so we're starting to measure uh, the dynamic and level of different checkpoint and kinetic core proteins in our monopolar spindle assay to ask whether or not anything kind of jumps out between the two of them. And so ultimately, we'd like to establish a molecular link between PAR proteins uh, and the checkpoint and also then ask whether or not any of this regulation is relevant in other cells, importantly, the GSPCs. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank members of the Maddox Lab and Lab A Lab, um, these folks for sharing strains, and I'm sorry I forgot to put the CGC on here, I really should have. Uh, these funding sources, um, thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions. And then I'll also run the mic to anyone else. Okay, so. Um, the, if I understand correctly, um, the, it's not just that you, your, your checkpoint is better to start with because you're maintaining it, right? So you have to have a continuous maintenance of some status in the, in the checkpoint arrested nucleus. And so do you think that, that, that there's some kind of constant supply of, of, com of some checkpoint component there? And have you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so there could be a lot of things that's causing the longer delay, but I mean, the way that the checkpoint is, norm is sort of now thought to work is more as like kind of a rheostat. So as long as you have more mitotic checkpoint complex, or the, at least the ratio of mitotic checkpoint complex to, to APC activity is shifted in favor of mitotic checkpoint complex, you'll delay. As yeah. soon as that balance gets tipped in favor of the APC, you'll exit mitosis. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. What, just and a comment. So, um, so in budding yeast, where this was discovered, right, the, the, um, the checkpoint component MPS1 actually is, is goes to the cell cortex. Uh, there, there are interesting cortical interactions, so it may be worth checking out that as a factor X, essentially. Uh, MPS1? Yeah. Yeah, so unfortunately, be. worms don't have MPS1. <laughs> Something like um, it would be good, though. I mean, some kind of orthologous, you know. Yeah, you know, so they have um, P, uh, PLK1 is thought mm -hmm. to be, yeah. to act in place of MPS1. And one thing that's sort of interesting is actually, um, PLK1 has been shown in a different um, context. It's actually, a, preferably inherited into AB. So AB mm -hmm. has more PLK1 than, than P1, so it actually kind of goes against yeah. what we're seeing. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we've thought about. Well, more of it, or more of it localized would be yeah. interesting. Yeah, we definitely should look at that. I wondered if you had considered the possibility that the differences in transcriptional activity in the P lineage and the somatic lineages might be involved. And the other question that I can't remember, never mind. So just. Just, just oh, oh, I know why, because I was thinking that if you had um, one explanation for the difference in the, what you observe with the anterior and the posterior pars could be that if you deplete the anterior pars, then both cells are acting more like P, like the P lineage. 
Yeah, so that, I mean, that's what we think is going on, at least in terms of depletion of the anterior pars. Um, it definitely could be germline um, transcription, and one of, or at least, so one thing that I didn't show is like if we look at later embryogenesis stages, so if we look at different germline blastomeres, P2 and P3, um, we see a slightly different phenotype in PAR6 at least. So in PAR6, um, you enhance delays in AB at the two cell stage, but if you look at later embryonic blastomeres, you basically lose any enhancement of checkpoint activity. And so we sort of think that at, at, at the two cell stage, there may be something really specific going on in terms of the segregation of some factor, but that you really need like maintenance of that factor later on, which is really linked to germline identity, and if you lose germline identity, you lose that, that extra regulation. Hello. Very nice talk. I just have a very naive question. So it's known in the several systems that mitotic slippage is associated with the levels of cyclin B that it starts to be degraded over time. So I was wondering if you looked in your system to the levels of cyclin B in the different cells and whether there is any interesting correlation there. Yeah, so I've wanted to do that experiment. So in the GSPCs, actually one of the ways that we looked at the checkpoint was measuring um, the rate of cyclin B degradation. Um, unfortunately, the current cyclin B that we have is just tagged with a normal GFP, and it actually doesn't fold fast enough to see expression in these early embryonic cell cycles. So we're kind of thinking about whether or not we could make like a superfolder cyclin B GFP and whether it would fold fast enough that we'd get appreciable GFP signal before the cells exit mitosis. But yeah, we haven't looked at that. Thank you so much. Thank you.